So I want to start with a story. Back in 2006, there's this lawyer, a guy named Mark Bragg, who lived up in Pennsylvania. And Mark decided, as a diversion to practicing law, he was going to start investing in real estate. And so like anyone who's wanting to invest in real estate, I, I presume his goal was you know, buy low, sell high, find undeveloped land that people didn't know about, and wait until it became valuable and make a profit off of it. And he was a technologically savvy guy, so Bragg uh, must have been pretty happy when he found that there were several parcels of land, just like the one he was looking for, that were being sold via online auction. And because he was technologically savvy, that must have worked really well for him. So he began bidding on this land on these online auctions. And as he was doing this, he allegedly learned that there were auctions that were all set up to go that hadn't been opened to the public yet, and if he tweaked the URL a little bit, he could jump into the next auction, bid, close the deal, and buy the land way below market value. Now, this is a good deal, right? So, in fact, uh, that's what Bragg uh, set out to do. Now, here is where the story would normally go like this. You'd normally say, well, when the landowner found out about this and felt aggrieved by this system, they rushed down to the courthouse and they filed suit to invalidate these transactions and reclaim the title to their land. But that's not what happened next, because you see, the land that uh, Mark Bragg was bidding on wasn't the kind of land that you and I think of as land. The land that Mark Bragg was bidding on was land in this place, the world of Second Life, one of these virtual worlds that you may have heard about, but may never have been to, or if you have been to, uh, you know, may not have spent a lot of time there. And so the owners of Second Life, who were running these auctions, didn't rush down to the courthouse to invalidate the transaction. They just shut its account down and took the land back, <laughs> right? That's when it went to the courthouse, and Bragg sued them, and the you know, ensuing legal battle was like a lot of other legal battles, kind of behind the closed door, and it settled out of court. And it didn't leave us with a lot of interesting legal precedent, but I think it's notable, and the reason I'm talking about it, and you'll read about it uh, if you study law in this area, is because it was the first of what are certain to be many, many uh, legal disputes in the non-virtual world that involve assets in a place like that, <laughs> right? The fact that people uh, go to places like this to do things um, is, if you aren't in the right demographic, somewhat of a mystery. And it's not just a few people that go to places like this. There are 175 active virtual worlds. I challenge any of you to name more than two or three of them if you're lucky. If you have kids of the right age, you might know of World of Warcraft. Um, you've heard of Second Life because of all the buzz. It was an early one. But there are a lot more. There are over one billion people, that's with a B, who use these worlds, that's more than live in the US and Europe combined, right? who spend tremendous amounts of time in these worlds doing all types of things. Some of them are there to play games or to role play. Some of them are there to socialize or to flirt. right? Whatever it is that they do, they are there a lot. And the virtual goods that exist in this world are worth more than a billion dollars uh, in US and in Asia where these systems are massively popular. There's over $5 billion worth of virtual goods in these worlds. What's going on here? Why are people going? Well, it turns out that we're at this interesting convection point where technology has simulated reality well enough, not perfectly by any means, but well enough that when you enter in to this activity, when you go to play these virtual games, when you go online to a place like Second Life, you get many of the same kinds of, of, of emotions, of, of feelings, uh, of rewards that people get from activities in the real world. These systems are persistent. That means if you're not playing, it's still there. There are people still there walking around. This is a screenshot from one of these worlds. Uh, they're, they're, they're visual. Um, you're not typing in your keyboard like an old chat system that some of you might be familiar with. You're talking into a microphone like this one and actually speaking with people. It is a very social uh, experience, a very uh, rewarding experience for people who do it, and people who do it tend to do it a lot. And it's an alternate place for them to live their life. I mentioned that they play games and they socialize and they flirt. Well, guess what? That's what we do in the real world, too. They just take it over there. It's interesting, it's sociologically fascinating,
But I'm going to propose to you guys for the rest of my presentation that it's more than that, that it's something we should all be watching very carefully because the ramifications of what's going on there have profound influence on what uh, we do in the non-virtual world. Somebody out there must be thinking right now, though, but it's just a game, right? These are just games. And in fact, you are articulating in, 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 in one way, if you're thinking that, something that game theoreticians have articulated in a more fancy way, uh, when they describe this imaginary construct, this boundary that circles gameplay, and particularly in these environments, that separates it from what we do when we're not playing games. They've come up with this wonderfully creative name for it. They call it the magic circle, the circle that surrounds things that happen in the game versus what happens outside the game where the rest of us are sitting right now. I'm going to argue that the magic circle is collapsing, that the difference between what happens in these games and what happens outside of the games is really not much of a difference anymore. And I think it's collapsing at multiple levels. It's collapsing at the social level and all types of levels. I'll give you an example of a social collapse of the magic circle. There's a somewhat notorious in, in a, the game culture story about a young woman who spent a lot of her time playing World of Warcraft, who met a very untimely death at a young age in the real world. Um, and many of her friends who were in this World of Warcraft world had never met the woman personally. They didn't know her, but they heard that she had passed away, and they wanted to memorialize her where they knew her, which was in the game. So they gathered their avatars for a funeral, and they all spoke and eulogized, and it was apparently a very touching, a very emotional event for them. This was the loss of a friend, right? Well, this is World of Warcraft, where the object of the game is to, to, to engage in a, a role play that involves swords and sorcery and battles, etc. And this collection of people peacefully eulogizing their friend was a very tempting target to their rival clan who descended on them in the game and attacked and stole all their goods and killed their characters, etc. Okay. You're going to have one of two reactions to that. <laughs> okay. Probably depending on which side of the battle you were on. Obviously, to a lot of people, that was a heinous, immoral, unethical, terrible thing to do. Here we are, eulogizing our friend. And to the guys and girls in the clan that attacked, who, by the way, have memorialized the brilliance of their attack in a wonderful YouTube video, which you can watch, it was one of the great gameplay moments of their World of Warcraft existence, right? Because they said, it's just a game. That's what we're here to do. This is a clash of game culture and real world culture going on. Right? They were eulogizing a real world death, they were memorializing a real world death, but the people they were attacked by were still playing a game. Right? I think that's a really fascinating clash, and it's an example where the game circle, the magic circle, is eroding, but the much more stark and interesting erosion of the magic circle is happening with this stuff. This clicks on. Money and gold. These worlds are really rich. They're very immersive. The technology is really good, right? And they want it to feel like the real world when they design these systems. So when you go into one of these systems, not only can you walk around and interact with one another, but you can possess things. Because possessing things is a very core human experience, right? If you have kids, I have four. If you have kids, you know this, because what's one of the first words a two-year-old or one-year-old utters? Mine, <laughs> right? It, we know that. You, you know, taking things from kids brings about a reaction, right? And so the designers of these systems know that it's one thing to play in the system and walk around and talk, but it's really important to give people things. You know? So if it's a game like World of Warcraft where people are playing sword and sorcery, you have to have swords, right? And if everyone has a sword, it's not nearly as fun as if everyone doesn't or if there are better swords than other swords. And so the game designers have developed a system so that people can have possessions. Right? Of course, as soon as you can have possessions, you have the foundation of economy. Because what happens is, I covet your possessions. 
right? I see your sword that might be better than my sword or, or, or your belongings that I might want, and I try to figure out how to get them. I can get them by brute force, perhaps, by battling you. But if I have something you want, what can we do? We can trade, right? That's barter. That's the earliest sign that you have a, a beginning of an economy. And it doesn't take long to get from bartering to getting to things that are basically surrogates for property. And we know that as currency. And in fact, in these real, very realistic game environments, there's currency. It's not real. It's virtual gold or virtual uh, items, beads or whatever it might be. But people trade this currency for real things. Things create value. Uh, things have value. And there's this entire economic activity going on inside the game. That's interesting enough in and of itself. Where I think it becomes really fascinating is in the fact that because, after all, they are real humans playing these games out in the real world who covet these things, albeit virtual things, we can't help but assign real world value to those things outside of the game environment. So there's two ways I might want to get the wonderful sword that you have. I might use my in-game gold, but if I know you in the real world, I might say, hey, if I gave you 20 bucks, would you give me that sword? Right? When that happens, we get a connection between virtual value and real value, which all of a sudden assigns real, actual value to those items. And this isn't a new phenomenon that's about to start happening. This is something that has been happening in these environments for years now and has created a very clear nexus between the value of the fake stuff and the value that corresponds to it in the real world. How do we know this? Because you can go to eBay right now, if you're online or when you get home, and start looking up items from systems like Ultima Online or EverQuest or World of Warcraft, and there are thousands and thousands of entries for virtual items that people are auctioning off for real money Right? that then you can go into the system and then you, you make the exchange and your PayPal account gets credited and you actually sold it for real money. There are virtual currency exchange right, where people are tracking exchange rates. How many Lindy Bucks from Second Life or uh, World of Warcraft gold pieces does it take to get a dollar and vice versa? And these currency rates fluctuate just like the rate between the dollar and the yen or any other currencies. After all, they are all currencies. In fact, the dollar bill that may be in your pocket is, in essence, a virtual currency, if you think about it. It has no real value. It's a piece of paper. But we've assigned value to it, just like people in these systems have assigned value. And it's a lot of value. If you think back a couple of slides ago, we're talking value in the billions of dollars of the accumulated wealth of this imaginary set of property. There is a report that a player in a system called Planet Calypso, if I'm getting that right, recently spent three million of their virtual currency units to buy a space station, which, if you track the exchanges for that virtual currency unit, equates to about $330,000 right, for a virtual space station. There's enough money in it that there are entire businesses that have sprung up where people play the game to accumulate in-game wealth and then go and exchange it for real money. We call these people gold farmers in the parlance. Right? There's, a, there's a science fiction author named Neil Stevenson who was in Austin this last past week uh, speaking at a game conference, and he's a great science fiction author. I highly recommend his work, Snow Crash and Cryptonomicon and all these wonderful books. And he says about gold farmers in his talk, you know, gold farmers are the kind of thing that make me want to quit writing science fiction because I could never think of anything that, that weird, right? <laughs> that people are out there actually doing this. How weird is the gold farming phenomenon? There's a prison in China that was reported in The Guardian where instead of being out on the chain gang hammering and breaking rocks, the Chinese authorities make the prisoners play World of Warcraft so they can take their winnings back into the state. Yeah. Right? The circle between online worlds and offline worlds is, is is collapsing. It, it, it just is. There's, there's no doubt about it. You know, this isn't, however, particularly new because we've had games before where we play with virtual currencies that have real-world economic effects, like this one, poker, right? In poker, you know, a chip 
is not real, but it, we know what it costs, and if you're playing at a casino, you know, you, you, you can actually win or lose money playing this game, right? But there are real specific rules about poker and what you can and you can't do, and in some of these virtual environments, we don't have such clear rule sets. I'll give you another game where we, by the way, have kind of real-world impact that we don't necessarily treat the same way. If I were walking down the street and I were to tackle you, I go to jail for assault and battery. If I'm playing this game and tackle you, people cheer, right? So there's clearly game environments where we, where we don't apply the real-world rules. But there are also game environments that are very different, like this game. This is hopscotch, right? And kids play hopscotch um, with a piece of chalk and some pavement. And hopscotch is not as heavily regulated as poker, where if you cheat, you get in trouble, or football, where an official throws a flag. Kids, particularly little girls, play hopscotch and create their own game. And as they improvise, the game starts looking different, right? Because there's no one there to call foul. They just work with each other as they're playing the game, say, let's try it this way. It might be more fun if we change the board or we change the rules. This is what's happening in virtual worlds. People are changing the rules to experiment because what happens in there isn't governed by our laws. This guy is a guy named John Rawls. He's a Harvard philosopher, passed away a few years back, who wrote a fascinating book called The Theory of Justice. And Rawls says the best social systems would be the ones that we've never seen before when he was writing, which are created by people who don't know where they are in the social order. Right? That makes sense. He called it the veil of ignorance. The people who make our rules today, lawyers and legislatures, know exactly where they are in the social order when they make the rules. You know, to harken back to an earlier talk, it's easy to legislate a wall when you know what side of the wall you're going to be on, right? But if you don't know where you're going to end up and you create rules fresh, those rules end up being the fairest rules. Why? Because justice has always, at least uh, in myth, had a real interesting characteristic, which is the blindfold. <laughs> Justice is blind. In online worlds, people are creating new rule sets at the very outset, as one of these new systems come on, how they're going to govern themselves, and they do it blindly, and we should watch what they're doing, because we've never had the social experiment that we have going on in these hundreds and soon to be thousands of online worlds to study. New social orders in the real world happen every once in a while after a revolution or a massive coup or a change through a massive election. And we don't start from scratch in those circumstances. We, we, we safely run back to systems we know and love. But the kids in these online environments are starting from scratch. They're creating new rule sets. And as the circle that surrounds these games collapses, we're on a collision course to their worlds intersecting with our worlds. And we should watch how they govern themselves because there may be something there we can learn. Thanks.